Um, my name is Erica Mazaris. I am a graduate student at Eastern Michigan University studying linguistics. And this semester I've been working on utilizing some of the linguistic analysis tools that I have to help improve human autonomous teaming. Um, so one of the great things about the autonomy incubator is that it uses uh, agile project management, which allows really quick idea generation, development, prototyping, and testing. And one of the ways this was realized, especially for us interns, was that it allowed us to meet uh, very often, once a week, to talk about any problems we were having with our projects, uh, any roadblocks we've run into, any great achievements that we've made. And this is actually one of my slides from one of those presentations. You can see I discuss, um, hopefully you can see, that's a little small, but uh, objectives, approach, milestones, and even there's a sweet picture of the spring um, so back to this exemplar science mission that Danette was talking about earlier. You can see that my work has been focused on the first area here, right at the beginning. The human is interacting with the autonomous system. Um, my work is trying to make that even easier in order to enable a couple of key things that we'll talk about in a little bit here. So most users, when they're working with technology, and that's everything from computers to autonomous systems, the drone said, uh, flying here, uh, end up verbalizing. And very frequently, these verbalizations uh, take the form of very vague questions, like, what's it doing now? Or, why is it doing that? Um, this happens even more frequently when you have multiple humans on the same team. Humans like to verbalize for each other. So, humans can understand this really easily. They have a lot of semantic context to work with. They know what the other humans on their teams are talking about. The same can be said necessarily for the computer. So, how do we enable them to help better answer these questions? Uh, can we infer the commander's intent or the intent behind these vague questions in order to provide information to the user? Uh, if we can, this can go a long way to help establish trust between the human and the autonomous system, and even increase usability so that non-subject matter experts can use these vehicles in the field. Um, so I wanted to work on a way to help infer that commander's intent. And my initial plan here was to develop a semantic map of utterances used to communicate with drones or human communication around working with drones. I wanted to create a two-dimensional semantic map that allowed you to see visually and actually uh, numerically how close two things were related semantically. Um, and then you could even map something new to that same space and determine the semantic meaning of that new utterance. We'll go in a little more detail about what this means in a little bit, but for the beginning part of my internship, I had to go through um, some city training and institutional review board applications in order to start some observations of actual human communication around drone work. Um, and so I did that right here in the autonomy incubator for the lovely autonomy incubator folk, um, as well as out in the field while they took drones outdoors. And I took notes on things that they said um, before flying, during uh, drone operation, and some post-flight discussion. You'll see the picture on the, on the right here, or some of my notes, which are more or less <laughs> intelligible. <laughs> There are pages and pages and booklets and booklets of these notes. I was able to get more than um, almost 1,600 utterances from this. And so this helped form the basis of deciphering what the semantic sphere of working with autonomy might look like. Um, so now that I have the data, or eventually once I have the data, what to do with it, I decided to make use of a, linguist, a linguistic tool called latent semantic analysis, which is a well-established tool in the field of computational linguistics uh, and what it does is it determines the degree of semantic relationship between two different utterances. Uh, this is probably most commonly seen when one, one utterance is a keyword search term and another utterance is a web page. And it's often uh, forms the backbone of search engines that you'll find on the internet. But for our purposes, this was going to be two utterances used while working with drones. Um, and I would take this tool, LSA, uh, and form a uh, a term document matrix where it takes all of the terms used within all of the utterances and uses those as the rows and then all the utterance form the, uh, the columns and then each time a term or the number of terms the number of a given term used within that utter utterance forms the value for that matrix um, so we're going to look at an example now so that can make sense but once you have that term document matrix you can decompose it using singular value decomposition you can scale it up using multi-dimensional scaling, and then you can plot those uh, on the graph and see visually what the semantic sphere looks like. So we'll walk through an example here, uh, taken from Dr. Seuss. 
Um, so you have the first four lines of uh, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish up here. Um, and I've broken them down into four different utterances. You can form a term document matrix based on this, which would look something like this. You'll see all the terms down as rows here. All the utterances form the columns. And for the first utterance, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, you'll see that the word one is used one time, the word fish is used four times, etc. For the second utterance, we also see fish used four times. The third utterance is not used at all. And in the fourth utterance, it's used one time. So we can decompose this, scale it up, and graph it so you can visually see what this looks like. You'll see utterance one and two down at the bottom closest together. These are the ones that use fish both four times. And then uh, utterance four is fairly close, but still further away than two. Uh, and that's the one that used fish one time. And then utterance three is furthest away, and that's the one that used fish zero times. So you can start to see how utterances clump together that are semantically related here. So um, this is Dr. Seuss is not really you know, working with autonomous systems. So what does this look like when you're uh, getting out of the kids' books? Um, well, I developed an LSA tool in the R statistical programming language, which is great because it has a lot of pre-developed packages for corpora generation, for singular value decomposition, multidimensional scaling. Um, and once I had this tool, once it was producing maps, I also implemented k-means clustering to start forming semantic clusters within the map. And everything within these clusters would be somewhat semantically related. And from that, I could develop labels for those clusters. Well, everything in this cluster is related to this, and everything in this cluster is related to something else. Um, and once you have these maps, you can also continuously train them by adding more data, new, new utterances. If you map an utterance incorrectly, you can get rid of that. Or if you map something correctly, you can weight that a little more highly. So for the autonomy incubator, it looks like this. You'll see the, uh, the cluster near the top in dark blue. I map to uh, visual observations, and this contains words like want and see. The light blue cluster, I map to hardware-related utterances, and these are things like work and turn. Uh, the bottom one is immediate commands like whoa, now, stop. Um, the black one is uh, software-related, things like script, run, and then the red one is data analysis-related, things like check and data itself. So this is what uh, the <laughs> all the communication within the autonomy incubator looked like over the course of the last semester. Okay, great, we have a map. What do we do with it now? So I uh, wanted to develop something that I've been calling the information provider, which takes this map and utilizes it to help infer commander's intent. And it does this by starting with transcribing speech to text using CMU Sphinx 4 software. When the system realizes that it's heard a question, it triggers my software, which run, it maps the uh, utterance, that is a question, and its immediate semantic context to the existing semantic map. Um, once it's done that, it can determine the cluster that the utterance is most closely related to, and then provide information based on that cluster back to the user. Um, once it's done that, if it's mapped correctly, we can save that back into the system and use that to help further the semantic map, make it even better. Uh, and I have a little example of what this would look like. You can see here we have a, a GUI with a, uh, a map that's got some sensors placed at locations marked with the, uh, the red here locations. Um, I've highlighted the top one because that's the one I've selected, but I don't remember what sensor I've placed there. So maybe I'm talking to my system and I go, oh, hey, what does this sensor do? And it tells me, oh, this is the ozone sensor. I knew that you wanted this information so I could provide it to you. And then I go, oh, uh, that's been out in the field a while. I wonder how its battery is doing. And it can tell me because it's related to the battery. And then if we go into the GUI, we can see that we have a history of information provided, um, both uh, what does the sensor measure and what's its battery doing. And the user can provide the system information about whether that utterance was mapped correctly. If it is, we can save it back into the system. If not, we can toss it out. And this way, we can continuously grow the map. All right, so now I have a little demo of the first part of this working in real time, which will be fun. So right now my um, LSA tool is running in the background and it's trying to listen for a question and then map it and provide information to the user. The text is a little hard to read, so I will tell out loud what's happening. So first, I've said something like, okay now, and the system has heard of Xiao, which is not super correct, but that's what it thinks is happening right now. Um, Next, I'm gonna say something about the software, which is literally, I'm gonna talk about the software now. The system has heard, but software now. It's pretty close. It at least gets software in there. 
um, is continuing to listen to what I have to say. Uh, and I've said, um, we'll install some programs. And it's heard Zhang sell some programs are. <laughs> and then Anne do some other software stuff, which it has heard as Jack and do some other software stuff, the closest yet. Then I say, and the program is now running. So it hears, and Graham is running. And now I'm going to ask it a question. I'm going to ask it, what program is running? Down here, if you can tell, it says, uh, question. So it's identified this as a question, which means that it's triggered my LSA tool. So in the background, it's taking all of the semantic context and the question that's just been asked, and it's mapping it using the LSA tool. It's mapping it and then determining which cluster it's closest to, and it's going to provide the number of the cluster that it's closest to, as well as the category that that cluster relates to. Uh, you'll have to give it just a second here, which is something we'll come back to pretty soon, too. Um, there's a lot of background processing that has to go on with this because it's comparing this to a lot of other documents. So you'll see, or hopefully you can see, uh, that it says three software related, which means that uh, my program has mapped all of this information to the cluster that is software related, which is probably true because I use software in like every sentence. Um, but you can see how this might be able to provide you with information based on what you're talking about. And this is really cool. It's inferring the intent behind my question. So what can we do with this going forward? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but that took a lot of time to process. It took a lot of time to provide you feedback. And you are a user in 2016, and no one has time for that anymore. So one of the first steps is to trim this down. There are ways to speed this up and let it run in the background uh, much more quickly. So going forward, it would be great to create a trimmed down version of this and actually hook it up with the GUI that's used uh, to interact with drones here. Uh, we can reduce the time for category determination, um, and we can even use all of my observations of the autonomy incubator at the beginning of the semester to create a dictionary that Sphinx can use to help translate the text faster, too. Uh, we can also use all of this to create a new LSA-based metric for human autonomous system teaming. We can determine, hopefully, quantitatively, how well the system is working based on the values we get from this LSA analysis. So some lessons that I've learned throughout the course of the semester is that uh, observation modifies language use. And this can be both accidental and purposeful. Um, when people in the autonomy incubator realize that I was recording things that they were saying, they oftentimes like to sway my data. Um, you'll see a picture of a nose flute up here. Um, this is because while running an object detection identification software near the beginning, um, I, the system detected a nose flute, and we were very curious about this because we didn't know that a nose flute existed, let alone what it was. Um, so that got repeated a lot, which meant it made its way into my data a lot. Um, then we also get some accidental semantic bias here, too, where people may be talking about um, how they're going to fly their drone today, but then also talk about their kid's birthday happening that weekend. And we don't necessarily want to associate children's birthdays with flying drones, but it happened in that one case. Now, with enough data, we can get rid of that. It'll just uh, drown in the noise. And that's fine. That's great. But it means we need more data. Um, there's also something to be said for having someone with a notebook standing and following you around wherever you go. Maybe this isn't the best way to capture this data. Uh, and this is a, a lesson that we can take to heart going forward. Um, also, generalized speech-to-text tools are fairly slow. Now, for our purposes, it's exactly what we needed because we needed to get in, modify the code. Um, also, clearly, my tool was not very fast, so Sphinx wasn't the only thing holding us back here. But going forward, it might be great to have some less generalized tools to work with, something that goes a little faster. Um, also, all of this has been based on LSA as a linguistic tool which is a fairly robust tool, which is great, but it's also fairly slow because of that. So maybe there are some other tools that sacrifice some robustness for speed. And that way, we can speed up the program. So I also have some acknowledgments here. Um, first of all, thank you to Anna for bringing me on board this semester, um, for Kyle for building the GUI to attach this to, and to Danette for bringing all the interns on, as well as the rest of the team for letting me observe you. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> to the, uh, my fellow interns, thanks for putting up with me this semester, um, and to Jada, Christine, Carly, and the NIF staff, thanks for bringing all of us on board. Uh, so that's my work for this semester. Do you guys have any questions? So what's next? Where does, where does this go, I guess? Um, there are a lot of places it could go, 
And one of them is obviously I'd love to hook this up to the actual GUI and get it to provide information in real time. But another place that I think would be really interesting to go is um, a lot of the vague questions that get asked while working with autonomous systems end up using um, language like that or this, these uh, very didactic demonstratives, right? Um, so I'd love to have to work with some gestural information as well to factor that into a language analysis tool. So you can include something like that drone, not that drone, and the language with the pointing mechanism together can be combined to interpret the intent of the user. I think that'd be really interesting. Do you have any idea or any, any plans uh, what that looks like in the near future? I mean, there's yeah, I will be here over the summer, so hopefully I'll get a chance to work with, um, there's another intern coming in who specializes in gestural information and gestural interfaces, so it'd be great to work together to see if we can make something even greater than either of us individually. Okay, you enjoyed your time, right? I, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you ask, yeah. Leading the witness. Most of it, yeah. yeah. No, it's been great. This is a, a wonderful team of really interesting people who have a lot to contribute on many different fronts, yeah. Yeah, Steve. Two questions. Yes. One from your semantic list that you thought about creating a drone language. Yeah, I think uh, I think that'd be really cool. Both from like a conlinger's perspective. Sorry. Um, have I thought about creating a drone language? Right. So there's a there's an interesting aspect on creating a language there, which could be interesting and would be interesting for any linguist. But also very pragmatically, having a drone language makes it much easier to interpret the question being provided. Um, however, it limits the usability somewhat. Uh, one of the reasons we really wanted to create uh, a verbal interface that can infer intent like this is it opens it up so anyone can use it. Uh, they don't have to come at you with the right commands. They can use natural English. So if we create a drone vocabulary, does that limit it somewhat? It's an interesting question, and it'd, it'd be really interesting to continue investigating. Yeah. Uh, the question is, what was the, the basis for, for the graph, basically, moving from the uh, term document matrix into the two-dimensional graph? Um, and, and that's based on the eigenvalues produced from singular value decomposition of the term document matrix, right? We scaled it up using multi-dimensional scaling, but it's basically just the eigenvalues of that. So uh, the, the values that you see on the graph are, are just maps of eigenvalues. So that's interesting, right? <laughs> Uh, eigenvalue sounds impressive. Yeah. Um, so, so while Michael's getting set up, Erica, what say you to someone in the audience that might say, well, Siri solved all these problems? <laughs> Has Siri solved all your problems? <laughs> how, how frequently does she get what you're asking her uh, correct? Right? Yes. Yeah. So we get this a lot, right? One of, one, of, one of the jobs that we have here in the incubator is to educate our audience and the rest, whoever might be here, about how these problems aren't really solved, despite what you may see online and, and you know experience with some very specific case studies. And so that's why I was saying, why are we still doing this? If Siri has solved all of our problems, and your answer is great, has Siri solved all our problems? <laughs> um, you know, and what does that mean? So yeah. that's what I was getting at. All right, thank, thank you, you so Erica. Much, Another round of applause for Erica.